Well, um, welcome everybody to the first educational event sponsored by the Longmont Climate Community. This will be a three-part series starting today with what is in our air. My name is Karen Dyke and as someone who developed asthma after I retired here, it is a subject that's pretty constantly on my mind. Please pose any questions you have in the Q&A section. Um, enter them as you think of them, and we will answer as many as possible today after the session, and we'll answer others by emailing the responses after the webinar. Um, we will also watch the chat section if you have technology issues or have something uh, additional you would like us to know, uh, but the Q&A section will be best. Um, so um, we are ready for our first speaker, but his technology isn't quite up to par, but um, our first speaker is, um, I'm very pleased to welcome him, Dr. Detlef Helmig. Dr. Helmig is a well-known and respected research scientist with over 200 published peer review articles and is also editor in chief of the atmospheric science domain Elementa. Dr. Helmig is on international committees studying climate and even has a couple of patents. We all know him best as the founder of the Boulder Atmosphere Innovation and for monitoring pollution related to the fossil fuel industry here in the Northern Front Range area. So um, Dr. Helmig, he, uh, his camera won't work for some reason, but he can share screen, so we'll let him start. Yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, good to be on this symposium. Um, yeah, apologize for this technical issue here. Um, I assume you can hear me now and can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So that, those are the most important parts. So um, yeah, I wanna um, give you an update on work we've been doing and um, I've presented um, overviews of this air monitoring program on quite a few occasions over the last year. So many of you may have seen this presentation or parts of it. I tried to put a few new things in there, um, but there's only so much that it's new. Um, after having given this similar presentation just a couple months ago to the city council. So let me walk you through this here. Okay, there we go. So I've, I've picked um, three, three topics, um, just a quick introduction. Um, of the air quality monitoring program that's ongoing. And then what do the data tell us about emissions releases from oil and gas operations, since that's a focus of this symposium here and the impact on air quality. And um, then what can we tell from the data about how effective changes in regulations um, have been? So let's get started on that. Um, and I'm gonna show you data from a total of four different uh, monitoring locations. There are a few more by now in the region, um, but to show you where they are on this map here in relation to oil and gas well sites, which are all these, these brownish dots here. Um, I'm gonna show you data from Nybot Ridge, which is up in the mountains of the peak to peak highway for a comparison. Um, how air looks outside of the region, and then observations from the Boulder Reservoir, um, data from the two Longmont sites. One is at the um, airport in Western Longmont, and then at the Union Reservoir, which I think most of you know the best. Um, again, these are how these monitoring um, programs look, the two sites in Longmont. The left one is the one at the airport, and we started there operating in September, 2019. So I have about a year and a half of data now. Um, the one on the right is the site at the Union Reservoir. that's also been running for well over a year now. Um, they run both continuously around the clock, um, recording all these different variables that are listed underneath. And then the data gets um, pushed to a web portal that, um, you know, reports all these measurements, both in tables and in graphical format for everybody to see and follow current um, air quality conditions. Um, to give you an 
an idea how things look here in the front range compared to when you step outside of the front range. What I selected here is a comparison of one of these gases we measure, and this is ethane. And we really like ethane because it's a, it's a really nice selective tracer compound for oil and gas emissions, since ethane is not really released from other sources at significant amounts. So ethane gives us a very good signal of the indicator, you know, how much do we get from oil and gas operations. So that compares ethane measured at Nybot Ridge um, up in the mountains, and that's in the bottom trace and at the Boda Reservoir, which is in the upper trace. And both of these are at the same scales. Um, so the same concentration range. And you can see it's, it's really, really different. What you see at the Boda Reservoir down here in the plains is lots of spikes, ups and downs, ups and downs all year round. And it gets a little bit heavier in the winter. These, these the higher peaks are mostly in the winter. And you don't see that outside of the region. But then these spikes come down again. You know, they come down and down and down all the time. So the, the important thing to note here is that we are subjected in the front range to these spikes. These are spikes or plumes, plumes that travel over the area and that have elevated concentrations of these oil and gas VOCs. And they can last depending on where you are, anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, sometimes maybe half a day or so. So we are an environment that's, that's abundant with these concentration spikes. Um, so, you know, you saw the difference between the Boda Reservoir and Nybot Ridge. Um, now this shows the difference between the Boda Reservoir and the Longmont Union Reservoir. So Boda Reservoir, you know, looked really high with lots of spikes, lots of peaks compared to Nybot Ridge. Um, this comparison now shows that at Longmont, um, there's even more spikes or mostly higher spikes than what you see at the Boda Reservoir. You can see at the map up there that the Union Reservoir side is quite a bit closer um, to where the well density gets really, really tight and there's, there's lots of them, much more wells in closer proximity. So that, you know, gives us an indication that you know, the, the further you move into the core of the oil and gas development area, the more of these spikes you get and the higher the concentrations are. So this was um, ethane and um, there's many people who are interested and concerned about benzene. So that's the same slide comparing the data for benzene. Again, left the, um, the Boda Reservoir and on the right side, the Longmont Union Reservoir. And you can see there's, there's quite a um, higher number and again, higher concentrations in benzene that we observe at the Union Reservoir through the whole year. So there's a full year of data roughly. Um, now, this is uh, something quite remarkable that we observed this year. Um, this, again, this is ethane at the Longmont Union Reservoir. Um, so you can see on the right side of the graph, and there's some uh, eight, 9,000 measurements in here taken over a year. So there were um, a couple occurrences um, earlier this year in January and February where concentrations got really, really high. Um, you know, so the background is something like one or two parts per billion for ethane, and it got way higher than that. It actually got so high that it saturated our measurement system. Um, so we had to, you know, the, 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 the actual concentrations would actually be above what, what's covered in this graph here. Um, so I have the dates here. The first one was on January 6th. The second one was on February 1st, 2021. Um, and they were very short, um, but very high extreme concentrations. And I want to look at that a little bit more. Um, so these were, were plumes that were encountered at the Union Reservoir, very short lasting, as I said. And this compares different um, pollutants in this plume. Um, so what I want to um, communicate here to you is that when we see these plumes, these spikes, we, we never just see just one pollutant, um, one contaminant by itself. Um, it's, it's always a mixture. There's many of these VOCs together in this, you know, it's like a split pea soup. <laughs> There's lots of things in there. They come together and you can see this in the graphs here. Um, the spike had methane, ethane, propane, butane, benzene. So all of these went up together 
when these these plume events events happened. Um, now that zooms into the first of these occurrences on January 6th. And that, this now is much, much finer time scale. So if you look at the left graph, you can see this captures rather, this, this captures around an hour of data. And this uses the, the measurements from the methane sensor. And that's a very, very fast sensor that can measure at four second um, time resolution actually. So you can see when this, this spike happened, it was very dynamic. Concentrations went up and down, up and down, and they, the background is two, and it went all the way to 25. Within a few minutes, uh, it bounced around, and then it came down again, and it was flat again. So the nature of these, these plumes is that they are short, um, and they, they come with extremely elevated concentrations. Um, on the right side now, this zooms into this even further. Um, that now captures the, the measurement of the, the ethane in the sample, or it's, it's listed here as volatile, as volatile organic compounds. Um, I want to show that, that you know, as you evaluate these, these pollution plumes and data you may see, you've got to understand how these pollutants are measured. Like for the VOCs, we can only yearly measure a 10 minute average. And so we average over this 10 minute window. And you can see if you take the mean of this, this plume, it's actually much lower than these, these peak concentrations that you can capture with the methane sensor. So um, what factors into all of this is how fast can you actually measure? What, what do you have in your tool chest to capture this pollution plume? So here this is just an exercise. I use the methane measurements um, at one minute time resolution in the top where we are, we're lucky that we have this fast methane measurement. But if you had an instrument um, that only measures every five minutes, it's the second trace. And you can see the, the peak is not nearly as high. If you average 10 minutes, it gets flatter. An hour below, it gets flatter. And if you measure average over half a day, 12 hours, that peak almost disappears. So there's quite a few uh, monitoring programs out there that um, don't have the capability of this fast response measurement um, and samples may be collected averaged over three hours. Some of the state canister sampling is three hours. Some um, sampling goes over three days, integrated sampling. So you will never see, never notice these spikes unless you have an instrument in your hands that allows these very, very fast measurements. So the nature of this pollution and the way we see it here is such that, you know, it's, it's these, these short occurrences, very dynamic, very high concentration increases. Um, and to, to become aware of that, you really need to have a, a monitoring approach that allows you to, to capture these short-term episodic pollution events. Um, what I have done here is I look at these two events, um, January 6th and February 1st, and um, um, do some scaling and corrections for, you know, I mentioned to you that our sensor was, was saturated, but we have a way to get around this um, to, to estimate the actual concentration spikes that we had during that event. And that gets us to, um, to levels that are listed here for methane, ethane, benzene in the, the orange box, um, our estimated concentrations that are very significantly above the background. The background is to the right of that. And if you compare that, you, you get to the, what I call the enhancement factor on the very right. That shows you how many times the peak concentrations in these plumes were above the background. So for methane, for the first event, we come to a factor of 12. For ethane, we estimate that the concentration were about 1,000 to 3,000 times higher than the background. For benzene, it was 60 to 160 times higher at the peak time of the background. Um, the second event of these two big peaks um, was similar. Um, ethane was you know, between 5,000 and 3,500 times higher. Benzene between 20 and 120 times higher than what we typically see in the background. So you can see this is a very substantial um, increase 
in the levels of these pollutants than what we, what we normally see under clean conditions. So let's let's take a look at how it looked at how things looked like at the Union Reservoir when this happened. This is um, the image from the webcam. So there's a webcam there taking pictures every 15 minutes and we store those. And then if we see something unusual, we go back and look them up. So this is the first event on January 9th. A nice morning, um, winter morning, you know, reservoir is frozen. It looks clean, you know, you could never tell. Um, there's this, this very high extreme pollution plume traveling over the reservoir. And this actually looks into the, the direction where that plume originated. Um, and if you look at the winds associated to this plume, um, we, we can roughly estimate it what the source of this release must have been. And it's mostly within, most likely within this reddish shaded area. Let me add it, you know, a little bit of uncertainty on both ends. Um, but our best estimate is that this originated somewhere within that that pie slice there that's shaded in this this, this reddish um, color tone. So this is the first event. The second event on February 1st, uh, similar here, it happened in the morning. Um, um, and it looked very similar, calm conditions, not much wind. Um, couldn't tell from the image. And looking at the um, wind direction here, we come to a similar conclusion. Again, it came from the east, maybe a little bit further to the north, but you know, within the uncertainty of the wind measurements, um, these do overlap um, reasonably well. Um, now, looking at the combined um, sources, source sector of these plumes, um, we think it most likely originated from the area that's in between these two red lines here. And um, you can see from the yellow dots, you know, there's just quite a few possible locations, well locations where this may have originated from. We, we don't know with our data um, which one it potentially was. It could have been one even further out that's not even on this, this section of the map that we pulled out. Um, but, you know, if you look at, you know, the, 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 the candidates that would be the closest um, and look at the distance, you know, what's, what's really nice here is we know to the east, um, you know, there's the reservoir for a mile or something. So there, there's no well within the reservoir. So you have to go quite a bit further to get to these, you know, this, this would be the closest well. So you can see they're well over 10,000 feet um, distance. And nonetheless, you know, we see enhancements that are, you know, a thousand times plus above, above the background um, as these plumes travel across the landscape in the winter. Um, to compare that with the current setbacks we have in Colorado, which is 2,000 feet, and Boulder County increased it to 2,500 feet. Um, you know, these, these well sites are well beyond the current setbacks. So the, the message here is, you know, even with the, the current setbacks, um, under these type of conditions and circumstances, you know, you may still well encounter plumes with concentration enhancements that you know are as high as what we saw here in these in these data. Um, another thing to consider is you know there there are um, residential neighborhoods. There's a school um, that are significantly closer to any of these potential wells. You know we we saw these enhancement factor of a thousand more than ten thousand feet away. Um, you know if the wind swivels um, and there are similar type of releases, you know, you would expect that any of these, these populated um, neighborhoods or the school would be subjected to similar or potentially even higher concentrations within these plume events. Okay, so this is my first summary. Um, so, you know, exposure is largely determined by occurrence of short concentration spikes. I showed you these, these two examples. Um, the closer you are to the operations, the more spikes and the higher peak values we typically see. Um, these, these highly concentrated emission plumes can travel and maintain these highly, these, these concentration levels for much further than current setbacks. 
Um, and what, you know, we are kind of in a, a special situation here, um, given the topography, the meteorological conditions, um, with the elevation, the surface cooling, the cold winters we had, um, we get pooling of cold air, um, like low level inversions, you might have heard that term, and that really fosters um, the accumulation of these pollutants and it, it suppresses the mixing. So they can stay at these high concentration levels for quite some distance and travel across the landscape, um, especially in the winter when it's cold and there's snow on the ground. Um, so I have a few more things um, to look at, you know, because you know, I've been asked, can you see anything um, given, you know, there have been some new regulations and especially one that was enacted just on January 15th. So this is a summary from the CDPHG a website that lists updates on oil and gas regulations. And there's a lot of information and a lot of changes over the years. If you follow any of these links, you get all the details. Um, one particular one I'm going to look at here is the one that it was enacted, as I said, in January, and that um, um, prohibits venting and flaring of natural gas. Um, so, you know, without the venting and flaring, which we think is a major cause of these, these plumes, you know, we, you would expect a decline in the observation of these, these plumes that we see. So let's let's take a look at the data. Do we see anything? Do we see any change? Um, it's still pretty early, um, but what I've put out here is the ethane record from the Boulder Reservoir, where we have um, data for three more years than what we have at the Union Reservoir so far. Um, so you can see this is four years of data, and to the very right, um, I've I've highlighted the period after January 15, um, since flaring and venting has been prohibited. Um, you can see, you know, there, there's still a fair num number of spikes. You know, there, I don't see a very dramatic decrease in the frequency and the, the, the height of the spikes. You could argue that over the four year record, maybe there's been a somewhat um, decline in the, 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 the height of these concentration spikes. But overall, you know, it seems to be um, about the same as it's been before. Um, so we're working on this. We're trying to evaluate this, you know, quantitatively, um, how effective are the regulations? And one of the ways to do this, I, I want to show here. Um, so again, this is the comparison Boda Reservoir versus Nybot Ridge. You can see on the top, it bounces around all the spikes at the bottom. It's, it's much more um, level. If you do the statistical analysis on the right side in this, that's called box risk of plots, you know, that shows the spread of the data, um, you can see a site that's near a pollution source. We have a lot of these spikes contaminations. The data are spread far apart. When it's cleaner, you know, the spread is much, much smaller. So what we do now is we look at if that spread has changed. Has it moved from this widespread, you know, large difference between these different percentile values to where it is a more narrow distribution? So we, we can do this with the data we have. Um, so this shows the monthly um, data in, for, for the Boulder Reservoir um, over almost four years now. And, um, you know, this is binned by month. Given the levels go up and down every year from winter and the summer, to do this properly, what the, the, the proper way to do this is to compare the same month of every year. So you can't really compare January with, 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 with March or June. So just to show you why we're doing what I'm doing here is, um, so we compare this the spread of the data um, for a given month across the record we have. Um, so this is again for the Boulder Reservoir, it shows the data from 2017 to 2021 for January, February, March, and April. Now February, March, and April are after um, the January 15th implementation of the um, venting and flaring ordinance. Um, so if you look at the distribution in the data um, for ethane here, you know, has the distribution become more narrow? have the extreme values become fewer 
which are all these dots on top of the whiskers. You know, they show you the very, very extreme readings. You know, so if you look at the February data, is is twenty twenty one different than the prior years? I don't think there's a strong reason to argue for that. Same for March, um, April, maybe. You know, the April looks like it may be coming down a little bit. Um, but that's where we are. You know, that's what we're doing. Um, that's what we have in our hands to examine if and how effective um, the regulations have been, and if you do indeed see a change, um, an improvement, a, a lower abundance, lower frequencies of, of these events. Um, so that's my, my second summary. Um, we do see at the Union Reservoir um, a reduction or a lower number of, of spikes between 20 and 21. I didn't go into that in depth, um, but that's probably a, a change in practices for at, at nearby well sites. And I've presented that a couple of times before. Um, but from the, the longer term data from the Boda Reservoir that we have, it, there's not a strong argument to be made at this point um, that emissions and transfer from the um, Denver Julesburg Basin has, has dropped significantly as a whole. Um, you know, there, there may be a slight signature in there um, but so far, we don't see a very obvious change in the occurrence of these concentration spikes after the implementation of the um, um, Senate Bill 19181, which, as I said, became ineffective in January 15. So we're, we're on it. We're keeping our eyes open and, um, um, you know, hopefully um, with more data coming in over the next six months, over the summer, um, we will we'll have some um, um, more concrete um, findings to present on that particular question. So that's my last slide. And with that, I hand back over to, I think, Karen or Mitzi. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Helmy. Thank Thanks. Um, I think every time I hear Dr. Helmick speak, I learn something really new. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, Next, we have uh, one of our team, um, Mitzi Nicoletti, is, has some area photos from the Union Reservoir that we thought would be interesting to all of you. Mitzi? Yes, good afternoon. I'm going to get my um, slides going. Like. Good afternoon. I'm going to be showing some slides to y'all that are uh, photos that highlight activities that contribute to poor air quality stemming from the area in and around Union Reservoir in Longmont. This slide I took actually last year. This is Union Reservoir. Really pretty day out there. And Union Reservoir was actually constructed on top of a natural spring-fed lake called Calkins Lake, now Union. The reservoir was carved out during the last glacial age and is one of the only few spring-fed natural lakes in Colorado. On the northwest side of Union is one of our air quality monitoring systems and Detlev had talked about that. So this is last year. This picture was taken on April 30th this year at 6.43 a.m. This is a picture of the night well pad. It's an active drilling site. This picture was taken by a rower that was on the water and happened to capture this with the birds in front of it. So the night well is on the northwest corner of Union Reservoir and is 500 feet off the shore. This picture was taken on May 5th at 5.30 a.m. 
And this is a good example of flaring. We figure this flame is at least 60 feet. And the other thing is you can see the smoke coming off this flame. If you notice to the left of this flame, excuse me, yeah, to the left of this flame, look how close those houses are. And then you can also see how close you are to the water. The next picture I have is another one on May 12th at 6 a.m., another flame. Um, this particular picture was taken, like I said, at 6 a.m. And what we're noticing, this is occurring at least once a week, if not more. And you remember the first picture I showed you of Union last year, and then this is the picture I'm showing you today. Um, I believe the night well is contributing in a negative way to our air quality. I am very fond of this area and um, have always loved Union like I believe a lot of us do. This next picture shows the night well how close it is to this house. The next few pictures are just gonna show how much I think we all enjoy Union Reservoir. I took this picture last weekend. This is a couple sitting out actually fishing. And this picture is just various families out enjoying a Sunday afternoon. Uh, you know, people fish, they paddleboard. This particular day, there were no paddleboards. It was too windy. This is a picture of actually me and my boat. I love being out on that water as a lot of people do. Um, the morning is just such a great time to be out there. I was out on the water this morning and I was with a bunch of people and about 825 in the morning, I kept hearing this, it sounded like a release and I was right by the night well. So I stayed there for at least five minutes and listened to this sound um, that kept coming off until about 10 or 15 minutes later, it stopped. When I got home, I went to the Bold Air website just to see what was taking place at that time. And what I noticed during that window of about an hour, the butane, benzene, and ethane spiked. And then my last picture is one of my favorite friends, the hawk. There's a lot of wonderful birds around Union as there are all over Longmont. Our next speaker will go into more detail of what is being recorded in our air within our city. Karen? Yeah. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, they say a picture's worth a thousand wor words. So, um, you know, we certainly have uh, good evidence there. Uh, next up, um, we have more photos in the form of some clear photography presented by Andrew Kloster. Andrew is Colorado field advocate with Earthworks. It's an environmental nonprofit that works with frontline communities nationally and internationally to advocate for stronger regulations and transition away from extractive mining and fossil fuel industries. Andrew's from Michigan and was a political organizer and environmental educator in Cleveland, Ohio, before moving to Denver and joining Earthworks in 2020. He's worked for numerous environmental nonprofit conducted uh, climate change research with real communities in the upper Midwest and in Nicaragua, and is also a certified thermographer. He currently leads Earthworks oil and, ga oil and gas field work in the state of Colorado. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let me get my screen up. Cool. Everyone can see this? Awesome. So as Karen said, my name is Andrew Kloster. I'm the Colorado Field Advocate with Earthworks. And I'm going to try to be um, as quick as possible to move through um, my slides today so we can have some time at the end for question and answers. Um, but I'm going to be presenting on um, our oil and gas fieldwork findings from around the Union Reservoir um, in the period of January to May of this year. And before I really get into um, 
the actual findings, just in case there's folks on today who don't know what Earthworks is, don't know what we mean when we say the word fieldwork. Um, when we are referring to fieldwork, what we do when we visit oil and gas sites is uh, you'll see the image um, on the right, that wonky looking camera, that is the OGI optical gas imaging camera. These are specially designed industry standard cameras that can help us see, um, permit us to see pollutants that are not visible to the naked eye. And so um, these are what the regulators at the state agencies and the EPA use. These are what the operators themselves use to detect leaks on their site. And the pollutants that we're specifically kind of looking at with this camera are, as Detlev kind of outlined in his presentation, are methane and volatile organic compounds. That's what we're seeing coming off of oil and gas sites primarily. Um, these bullets on the slide kind of walk through the process by which we go through our field work. So Earthworks likes to partner with um, frontline community members, people who are living in these areas of high heavy oil and gas development. And we identify um, through their experience sites that are concerning to them, whether it's because of odors they smell or health symptoms, or just because they're in close proximity to homes, schools, parks, what have you. Um, we go out, we look at the sites from a safe distance. We never intrude or trespass on operator property. Um, and if we expose any sort of um, concerning emissions, if we see something coming off the site that seems significant or potentially concerning, we follow up with um, complaints to the appropriate regulatory agencies at the state level, which is primarily the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment as they have jurisdiction over air quality. But we also will sometimes file complaints with um, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So I'm just gonna really quickly breeze over this slide because I know the next uh, webinar in this series is really specifically about health impacts and the impacts of oil and gas. But just to provide some additional context about why when we're seeing um, emissions from a, a site and those emissions are potentially a combination of methane and volatile organic compounds, why we're concerned about those. For methane in particular, it's because as a greenhouse gas, it's much, much more potent and worse than carbon dioxide while it's in the atmosphere. Um, and for volatile organic compounds, our concern is primarily for those nearby or those in the direction of the plumes of emissions in terms of the, the range of health impacts that may result um, from breathing in the benzene and some of these other volatile organic compounds. And that can range from possible respiratory illnesses to um, cancers. And that stat at the bottom, I think is an important one to, to highlight. It's a little out of date right now. That's based on 2010 census data. Um, but as of 2010, 250,000 Coloradans lived within a half mile of an active oil and gas site. And that half mile is important as Detlev kind of highlighted a bit with the setback distance because that's really the minimally safe distance um, at which current research has shown um, potential impacts if you're within that half mile. But as you know, Detlev showed in his presentation, there's, that's not a hard and fast rule and wind direction, geology, um, the direction of the plume can impact that. But if we're just going by half mile radiuses, there's a significant amount of Coloradans who are being impacted by these sites. And that number is unfortunately probably much higher now, given that we've had quite a bit of population growth in the state over the last 10 years. Um, one last slide before I jump directly into the Longmont stuff. As an overview of our field work in general in Colorado, um, we've conducted just over 400 visits to almost 250 different oil and gas facilities. And this ranges from single well, kind of vertical well, pump your traditional pump jacks to the giant mega 20 plus well pads like the night pad that Mitzi highlighted. Um, we've also looked at midstream facilities, tank storage facilities, and at every type of facility we've looked at, regardless of size, regardless of production level, we've detected um, emissions. And not at every facility, but at every type of facility. And the types of emissions that we detect, one of the things I want to highlight, and I think one of the main takeaways from my presentation today, is these sorts of emissions, um, the ones that you know Detlev pointed out. Um, there's the flaring and venting issue, they, and they can occur for a variety of reasons. We can see emissions coming from tanks, which may be venting, it may be leaks. Um, there can also be emissions from other equipment on site, including the wellhead or other equipment where there's leaks. Um, there can be emissions due to inefficient or malfunctioning combustors on the site. Um, during different stages of a well's life cycle, um, there can be different um, emissions levels and the pre-production phase of wells, especially big fracking pads like the night pad are typically emissions heavy stages of a well's life when they're in the fracking and flowback stages. Um, 
And we've also detected emissions due to maintenance events, um, routine maintenance events that may be occurring on sites where they have to relieve the pressure in the well and they either do that by venting the gases directly into the atmosphere or flaring, trying to burn off, combust some of those gases, um, but that can lead to emissions as well. So, you know, a quick summation conclusion of this is that, you know, our, our broadly from our field work, what we can demonstrate is that no oil and gas facility is um, potentially not at some point in its life going to be polluting or have an emissions heavy event. And that's just something I want everyone to keep in mind that um, regardless of the size or again, the production level, um, this is a pervasive and persistent issue we find with um, filming these sites and seeing emissions from these sites. And that last statistic at the bottom is also, I think really important that of these little over 400 visits we've done, almost a hundred of them, so a quarter, have resulted in us filing complaints because of the admissions that we have seen on site. Um, so I'm gonna move now into the Longmont specific data. So we've taken, in, in part response to um, some of the air monitoring, what Detlev's air monitoring was picking up, um, we have done two sort of concerted looks at well sites around the reservoir. And I've also followed up um, a few times over the last couple of months as well. Um, so in January, we took a look at a number of sites. Um, I have them in the, as pins on this map. The ones that are red are sites where we detected significant emissions or significant enough to kind of take note of, I should say. Um, and from north to south, those are the Cub Creek Haley Pad, which is north of 66 there, um, the PDC Union site, which is just there on the south shore of the Union Reservoir, and then Extraction's Rin Valley site, which is just south of Sandstone Ranch um, off County Road 20 and a half. Then in March, we did another concerted sort of look at sites. We focused a little bit more, you'll notice, on sites to the east of the reservoir, um, but also looked at some of the same sites again. And you know, you'll immediately notice that the three that I highlighted in red in January were also highlighted in March because we detected emissions, significant enough emissions to take note of again at those three sites. And then we added two others to that list, most significantly, I think, being the night pad, which um, is the one if you, just north of the reservoir, south of 66, um, that Mitzi showed pictures of, and I'll have additional visuals of a little bit later. So again, for those who may not have seen Earthworks' work and how we present this stuff, the next couple of slides, the majority of my presentation is going to show on the left-hand side of your, the slide, you're going to see a digital photo that's the naked eye view of this site on that day at that time. On the right hand side, you're going to see an animated GIF, a clip from our OGI footage that shows hopefully about the same angle, it's about the same time that the photo was taken to demonstrate the fact that these pollutants that come off of these sites in the form of hydrocarbons, we can't see them, we cannot perceive them with our naked eye, but the OGI camera can see them and that's what it's designed to do. So this is the PDC Union site, this is the one that as I mentioned is just on the south shore of the Union Reservoir, and I should make a quick note about combusted sources. And so this is a combusted source that we're seeing. These are emissions from a combusted source. This, I talked about us filing complaints um, based on the emissions that we find. It can be a little hard with combusted sources. There's some ambiguity because to a certain extent, um, operators are allowed and permitted to pollute um, a certain amount of pollutants. And you know, when they're combusting excess natural gas, that operation is never going to be 100% efficient. So there's going to be some emissions that occur. These combusted sources are supposed to be much more efficient than alternatives, and they definitely are more efficient than venting directly into the atmosphere. However, when we have questions about um, emissions coming from combusted sources, typically, unless we can definitively prove that the combustor was not lit, um, our, our kind of inquiries to the CDPHE don't really typically go anywhere simply because the operators are taken at their word for whether or not these devices are operating as efficiently or effectively as they should be. Um, and that doesn't even really take into consideration the fact, which I think is important to consider as I walk through some of these other combusted sources, again, which are not necessarily things that we would file complaints on because they may not be, not they may be permissible, is that what is permitted for a single well site does not at the moment really take into a, a, account the cumulative impacts of all the surrounding well sites. So what one well site may be permitted to pollute is being kind of permitted in isolation of everything else. And we all know in the front range, our regional air quality is uh, not great. And oil and gas has a huge major uh, factor in that. And a lot of that has to do with the cumulative impacts of all of these sites. And 
even again, if they're within, if they're within their permitted limits of pollutants, um, they're still contributing overall to a, a regional problem. Um, so this was from January, you'll see uh, again, that combustor, there's some emissions coming off of it. Um, in March, we looked at the PDC Energy Union site again. This is from a different angle. I'm pretty sure that's the same combustor though. And it, once again, you see some emissions coming off of that combustor. Um, switching to the extraction Rin Valley site, if you recall from the map, this is the one that was south of Sandstone Ranch. Um, you see again, three combustors in a row. The one on the left-hand side has a plume of emissions coming off of it. Um, this one I would characterize as much more concerning as the last two videos, given, given just the characteristics of this plume, given how it's drifting off site. I have not heard back from the CDPHE on this specific video, but I have suspicions that this combustor may not be operating as efficiently as it should be, just given how much of that seems to be carrying off and is not being burnt off. Um, and then one last slide in terms of combusted sources, this is the Cub Creek Haley pad. Again, if you recall, the furthest north one, north of County Road 66. Um, two of those combustors um, going off. And I should also mention in kind of relation to Detlev's work, I, I would, unless it's a really poorly, if it's a really inefficient or malfunctioning combustor, combustor, I would expect that these would not be the sorts of things that would necessarily lead to the plumes, the spikes, given that this is kind of just background pollution on some of these sites that's going on continuously as they're burning off excess gas. Um, however, this next this next type of emission I'm going to highlight could be. So this, we're going back to the extraction Rin Valley site. This is set back from where those combustors were. Um, when we filmed this in January, we were really concerned about this video and because it looks as if that tank is just um, venting directly into the atmosphere, which it indeed is. Um, I filed a complaint with the CDPHE. They conducted an investigation. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, depending on where you land on this, this it was a permitted venting activity. And this is because they were performing maintenance on this site. So they were doing a liquids unloading event. They had to relieve pressure in the well. And in order to relieve pressure in the well, they just were venting the excess gas into the atmosphere. So again, kind of brings up the point that while this may be permitted, this is, a, you know, they have to relieve the pressure. So they have to vent according to the regulations. If you live, which you can't see, and if, th if this video were to keep panning, there's a farmhouse not too far from where we were standing. There's, you can see in the background, barns and homes. If you live in this area, it's not much consolation to find out that this is a permitted venting activity because that's a plume of emissions that is coming off of that tank. Um, and we're learning, as we learn more about some of these maintenance activities, I, in my mind, I, I go to the community of Erie right now that some of this is much more frequent, I think, than any of us realize. These liquids unloading events, some of these wells potentially are doing this on a biweekly basis. And so if these are the emissions we can expect every time they're doing maintenance events like this, that raises some alarm bells. It's particularly very, very concerning. Um, now focusing a bit on the night pad, which Mitzi already shared some pictures of. As I mentioned in my little overview, during pre-production phases of wells, um, when they're in their drilling fracking phases is typically a time when we do see very significant emission events. Um, and in March, we detected uh, emissions coming from behind the sound wall of the night pad. And you can actually see in the image on the left, these were visible emissions, not just, uh, not just something that, I mean, we really didn't even need the OGI camera to see them. Um, we subsequently have learned that this was due to an inefficient flare on site. The COGCC had inspected it. The flare on site was not efficient and was not appropriate for what um, the gas that they needed to burn off and was not burning off the gas, as, as you can see with the emissions. Um, this has been corrected for, according to my um, follow up with the investigation, and they have a much, they have a more appropriate combustor on site to burn off more of this gas and reduce the amount of emissions, which is in part potentially the, the shooting flames that you saw in Mitzi's photos. Um, so in a sense, potentially, you know, we're seeing a more efficient, the flames are still concerning, but if there's less emissions, if they're burning off more, that is hopefully a uh, positive outcome. However, the night pad is definitely not off the hook because I just, as of last week, was out um, looking at the pad um, in the evening, I think last Thursday evening, and I detected, as you can see in this GIF, it's a little hard because it's two um, fo photos clipped together, and the one gets a little washed out as I try to pan across the the plume of emissions, but this emissions coming from behind the sound wall that I picked up are definitely not from the combustor. This is a completely different source on site. And as you can see in the photos, 
These are 100% hydrocarbons, not uh, visible pollutants at all. Um, this was, you know, uh, I'm just got this GIF actually ready for this presentation. So I have not been able to follow up and file additional sorts of complaints or inquiries with the CDPHE and COGCC, but I will be doing so um, because this is particularly concerning given that they are supposedly investigating this or inspecting this site pretty frequently and they've already corrected for some of the issues with the flare. Again, though, this is a completely different source, um, not a combusted source on site. And I, I was going to share a quick video just to give another example of how bad some of these emissions events can be during pre-production, but I want to save some time, so I'm not going to share that. And this is actually not from the Longmont. This is from uh, the video would have been from 2018 in the Erie um, from the Coyote Trails, Extraction Coyote Trails pad. Um, but if you're interested in any of our videos, I'll just say we have a YouTube playlist for our Earthworks Colorado videos, and you can go and uh, horrify yourself. Um, by <laughs> playing through our playlist of videos in the state of Colorado. Um, then one last thing, just really quickly, I want to run through as another example, another type of emissions that we should all be concerned about. And this is also not from Longmont, but I want to include it because it's a really illustrative example of a major problem that we find in Colorado when we're doing our field work, which is leaks and the persistence and pervasiveness of leaks. So this site is actually north of Fort Collins in Larimer County. Um, we visited it for the very first time in January because residents nearby were concerned about odors they were smelling and had been concerned for quite a while and had been their, their concerns had been kind of outright dismissed by the operator. Um, we filed a complaint based on this footage. Uh, you can see on the right, this tank was literally just so poorly maintained that there were parts of it that were porous and they were just pouring leaking emissions off and that which were drifting towards the homes nearby. We filed a complaint. The operator was made to repair that tank. Um, we revisited this same site in March to confirm that these repairs had been made. And we did find that that tank had been repaired and the leak had been corrected. But there was another set of tanks on site, which in the beginning of March, you can see we saw these emissions coming from. Another leak, these were coming from the feed patches of this tank. We filed another complaint with the CDPHE. They contacted the operator. The operator was made to make additional repairs, supposedly only a few days after we were there. Um, I followed up again in late March, same. Uh, leak. And, you know, we filed an additional complaint with CDPHE. They reached back out to the operator. The operator claimed they still had additional repairs to make. Um, I can thankfully report that I just looked at the site again a week ago um, and was able to determine that there are no leaks from any of the tanks. So things have been corrected for now. But Again, this is an example I wanted to share because when we, in our experience, when we find sites that are poorly maintained where there are leaks, if we revisit those sites, we are inevitably going to find similar leaks or additional leaks. And it's a persistent problem all across the Front Range and in the Western Slope and Colorado in general, which just contributes again to our poor air quality and our, uh, you know, impacts on residents who live nearby. So that's my last slide. And, you know, in conclusion, again, I just want everyone to take away from this, not just the experience of seeing some of these emissions that we've been talking about, but recognize the fact that we have to be vigilant about every oil and gas facility because they all have the potential to be polluting and emitting like this. Thank you, Andrew. It uh, suddenly struck me listening to you that uh, you probably should be paid as an inspector by the state um, because I don't know that they're inspecting and they do have inspectors, but um, Obviously, they're too busy. Thank you very much. Uh, Lynette McLean is next up. She's another uh, one of our team. And uh, today she's going to present our call to action. A quick reminder that if you have questions that you would like to ask and are able to stay on, we are going to um, uh, answer some quick questions at the end. So uh, put your thing, put in questions in the Q&A section. Thank you, Lynette. Hi everyone. I practiced this uh, trying to get my screen to share, but I have not had any luck. So I don't know what, what is wrong, but anyway, I'll just say, let's see. Maybe I'll, let me try real quick here one more time. There it is. Do you see that? Can you see it? No, not up yet. Okay. That's okay. We can 
All right. Well, I will pull it up for myself so I can read it to you. Uh, all right. Hmm. I don't know. Sometimes just, okay. I will just say that um, if you want to report an air quality incident, and I'll put this in the chat, um, you can email the Colorado Department of Health at cdphe information at state.co.us, or you can phone them at 303-692-2020. And I will co copy all this and just paste it in the chat. Um, if you have, if you do report anything, we would like to know about it. So you could email the Longmont Climate Community at longmontclimatecommunity at gmail.com because we are collecting all this information. And you can also contact your legislator. There's a lot, uh, there's a number of bills that are up right now um, that, uh, that are related to air quality and uh, climate change. So it's, it's pretty exciting time really. Um, so right now we're gonna do questions and answer. Is that right? Uh, yes, it is. And we have um, Michael Belmont and Judith Blackburn are going to uh, pick through the questions and uh, they will tell you about the process. Michael and Judith. Thanks. Uh, fabulous, Detlev and Andrew. Uh, nothing less than frightening though, I have to say. Um, we have only a couple of minutes uh, technically or according to the agenda. So we understand that some of you may have to sign off. Detlef, Andrew, can you all stay for 10 minutes or so and answer a few more questions, a few questions? That would be great. And the questions we cannot get to, we'll try to get answers to and send the questions and answers to all of the participants uh, as well. So Judith and I will feed some questions to you, try to keep the answers to two minutes or less. Lynette will be our whip cracker for that, to that end. And, uh, Judith, do you have a, a question to start with? I do. This is a question for Detlef. Have you been invited or uh, asked by Governor Polis to present some of this information to him? Not yet. Short answer. <laughs> yes. I don't know what's happened to Detlef, so I'll I'll answer in part. Did you, did you get my answer? Did you, uh... You've got some microphone problems, Detlef. Oh my God. I think because you have two accounts open, you're getting a revamp. So can I uh, can I kick you off of the can I kick you off of the one that the video is not working? I'll mute it. Okay, let's try it now. Can you hear me now? Does this hurt? Oh, no. Um, let's see. I was going to ask you to unmute on that one, but um, no, you're, you're having a lot of feedback on that one. So maybe you could start the one that's got the video. So Oops. let's try this. This should work. OK. All right. That's work? good. OK. Um, except I cannot hear. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Okay. Oops, this is weird because I cannot hear you now. Ah. Um, anyway, so I got the question, um, which was whether or not I've been asked by Governor Polis to present any of this. Um, short answer is no. Hasn't, I haven't received that invitation <laughs> as of right now. That's the short answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I want to read an answer from Dr. Jane Turner to some, one of the pictures that Mitzi showed. And I'm reading from her answer in the Q&A. I wanted to let you know that I contacted COGCC regarding the visible flames at the night wells. I was informed that while regulation 903 does not allow flaming at the normal, as a normal process, combustion of excess gas is allowed during the drilling process. They are supposed to keep the flames below the sound wells the sound walls, and I lodged a complaint that the flames were too high. So that's what happens. I don't think she uh, was satisfied by their response. 
Uh, there was another question about whether those were reported. Obviously, they were, and I think Mitzi might have reported those as well. Yeah. And uh, there was a question, uh, Detlev, to you, cons is, 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 as far as flaring and outgassing, you used to monitor uh, I pentane and N pentane, and the ratio has that changed? Um, no, we we do monitor. I pentane and pentane at a total of four sites right now, Boulder Reservoir, Union Reservoir, um, Broomfield, two sites in Broomfield. They're part of the VOCs that are being monitored. We quantify on the order of 20 at each of these sites. They're all recorded on these um, four different dedicated websites. Um, there may not be a plot directly of that ratio on the Longmont website. That's a good reminder. <laughs> it's something we, I, I've, I've got to double check, um, but it's that's easy to implement. Um, yeah, um, but it is monitory. The data are here, we work with them all the time. Um, you know, there's two individual compounds being measured and you calculate the ratio, which you can do in real time on the fly, or you do it later. So all these data are available. Great. Okay, thank you. This is a question for Andrew. Is it fair to say that the self-monitoring and regulating that is supposed to be done by the oil and gas industry isn't working? Talk about what can be done about this. Um, yeah, I would say that's fair to say. Um, I think <laughs> the oil and gas industry has every incentive to not uh, report bad emissions. Um, I mean, that it's not really in their interest if they were, if they had awful emissions coming off their site to really monitor and or report them. So, um, I mean, I know, you know, we're still kind of waiting on some of the returns on one of the changes that was made last year is that sites that are in pre-production. So the, the night pad, for instance, now the operator does have to monitor, continue to have it continuous air quality monitoring um, for the first, for, through that whole pre-production phase, plus for the first six months of production. Um, the problem with that regulation and the problem with the way that it's written is that they are sort of allowed to do whatever they, they can determine what that means in terms of what kind of monitoring equipment they want to use and how they want to monitor it. It also doesn't, it's not like debt lives data. It's not continuously, even though there's continuous air quality monitoring, it's not available to the public in a continuous way. They report it back to the local municipality, um, I think on a monthly basis. So you know, we're still kind of waiting to see how that's implemented, but even, even if it was implemented, in, you know, fully, it's not really where we need to be. Um, having the, the operators monitor themselves and monitor their own air quality is not really a recipe for getting accurate and good data from these sites. I mean, we really need, really need air quality monitoring that is either third party or independent or from the state level in order to make sure that what we're, what we're seeing, what we're getting in terms of emissions data is accurate and available to the public. Good. Uh, maybe for you, Andrew, this is an interesting question. Speaking of monitoring and notifying public, who is responsible for alerting the public when there are poisonous emissions in the area, like at Union Reservoir, especially if the oil and gas companies plan to, re if and when, and as they plan to release gases, as a, an announcement to the vicinity of the dangers imminent? It, it, it's an interesting question and it, it depends. So for instance, I, I pointed out on one of those slides that liquids unloading, that maintenance event. So for those sorts of events, which are planned routine maintenance activities, um, the operators now have to give, I believe, um, believe it's 48 hours notice. It's not a ton of notice to uh, the surrounding community or the nearby community. So that doesn't necessarily mean like the individual residents, but I mean, for in Erie, for instance, the town of Erie has been getting these notices. Um, I believe potentially actually the residents have, but um, on this 48 hour, I believe it's 48 hour rolling basis in terms of when these are going to occur. Um, but it's, you know, um, 48 hours, I mean, we could argue whether or not that's an appropriate amount of time in order to kind of notify people. Um, but I mean, it's not, I guess there isn't really, given the lack of sort of um, monitoring on most of these sites, if we're not talking about routine sort of uh, activities where there would be advanced notice, 
then you know residents aren't getting note when some of these plumes for instance that debt has picked up no one is necessarily getting notice from any entity that those are occurring because outside of the air monitoring that's been set up um we don't know that those are occurring and drifting across the landscape um and that's there, there's just massive blind spots in regards to our ability to track this because there's so little monitoring going on hmm. thank you Okay, this next question might be a good lead in to advertise our next uh, series. The question is, is there any data available related to research into the levels of resident reporting asthma or other lung issues in the past versus the current day and compare those changes to the emissions? Maybe somebody from our committee would like to answer that. Because <laughs> that's really outside of the purview of the recording this data, this kind of data. Uh, this is um, Karen. Uh -huh. um, I do not think that there's any data. Um, I don't think that we currently, that there is a requirement for people to report, say, COPD or asthma or maybe types of cancers into a specific database. So unless there's a researcher looking at this, so for example, some research has been done on um, how close we are to, uh, how close somebody is to a well and whether or not there was a fetal um, um, abnormality or a premature birth but it's specific research done from hospital records um, and distance to wells. So there are some things that have proven positive, but we have no good database mm -hmm. that we I'm might, aware of. We might need a, a, a group of citizens willing to coordinate such a thing. I think volunteer scientists on the ground to just keep records, that's a very good idea. Um. Uh, Tim asks, how alarmed are you, the presenters, Detlev and Andrew, about what you are seeing and analyzing and presenting to us? <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good, good. Well, you know, I, 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 tr I'm, I'm, I see my, my role to provide information and, and data and, and, and good quality data to to the public and anybody who is who's concerned um to you know use it um in in their interests so i you know i try to steer back and <laughs> ringing alarm bells um but you know these these are very very high levels we see in these plumes that you know if you compare these data with other locations across the country, across the world. And I, you know, I have a background in, in global atmospheric chemistry and research. And um, these, these are the highest levels I've ever observed in my 30, 40 years of, of measuring air pollutants around the world. And there was one, one situation in the Junta Basin where we studied an oil and gas basin um, a number of years ago where we made similar observations. Um, but outside of that um, Junta Basin, um, these, these are very extremely high pollution plumes. And, you know, I'm concerned about um, people who live in, in the way of these plumes and are subjected to these, these, these highly elevated um, levels of volatile organic compounds. And we don't fully understand the, the, the health effects of these very sudden extreme increases in these, these VOCs. And, um, and these frequenting, you know, it's not just it happens once a year, as I showed with the data, these, these events occur dozens, dozens, hundreds of times a year, and the closer you live to the operations, um, the more frequently you are subjected to these plumes and the higher the, the concentrations are. And um, in one of my slides, I showed it's not a single pollutant, it's not just methane or isobutane, but it's always a mixture. <clears throat> There's, there's dozens and dozens of these VOCs together in this air. It's, it's a mixture and we don't know much about how you know, a human system reports to these multiple pollutants 
um, being being inhaled at the same time. You know, most of the the health studies that have been done um, concern exposure to individual pollutants, so the synergetic um, effects of these these different pollutants coming in all together. We don't know a whole lot about it. Um, so now there, there's 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 concerns and. Um, there, there certainly are reports from the community um, that report health effects. You know, so so associating the pollutants with the with the health effects. You know, that's that's another challenging area of of study and research, which is not my own expertise. But you know, with my work, I, I'm trying to contribute information to carry this whole discussion forward. Okay, I think we'll have this be the last question for this time around, but we will make an effort to answer these questions and get them to the people, especially who ask them. But this is the $64,000 question. <laughs> is anything being proposed, such as an actual state inspection schedule or local inspection and some real enforcement standards? And believe me, that is the question that's coming up for us in the future and has been with us all along since we first started noticing these problems. So, good question. No answer to it. We've tried lots of different things. Yeah, I mean, I'll just really quickly throw out there the fact that, you know, one thing for everyone to keep in mind in regards to state inspections of this um, is there are tens of thousands of active well sites in the state of Colorado and comparatively there are a handful of CDPHE investigators and so I mean the capacity is just currently not there for them even if they were doing the best job they could be doing their capacity is not there for them to match the scale of this problem um, and so for me you know really just briefly touching on that other question that Detlef so I think definitely answered was you know, in terms of what's alarming for me is given the extent of this problem, what we know, just what we know from what we can analyze and the data that we do have is that this is a major, major issue, a major, major problem. And the response from the state thus far has not been adequate to the scale of the problem. And that's what's most alarming to me, whether we're thinking about the health impacts on Coloradans or we're thinking about climate change and the potential health impacts on future Coloradans, generations of Coloradans and people across the world is the responses are just not where they need to be to actually resolve these issues and bring this industry um, under control. Okay, well, we will have to wrap up. I do want to say one thing, uh, Detley, if you were saying, uh, there, the, you sort of suggested the jury's out about the effects, uh, the health effects of some of these, but there's been massive research. I know the uh, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility has their massive collection of hundreds of peer-reviewed studies uh, over the last, I don't know, 10 years and uh, endocrine disruption, the, when the endocrine disruption exchange was active in Colorado, it was a fabulous research that uh, indicated uh, many serious health impacts of these things. Um, so more and more is coming out. Uh, so it, it is a serious question and um, that's why the setbacks, for instance, would probably have moved from 300 feet when we started this whole effort in 2012 to 1,000 now, whatever, you, you know. So hopefully it'll move, be even further out. But I think that's partly attributable to the, the gathering, uh, the, the mounting evidence that it's a serious health impact. Um, one thing I want, uh, Karen, can you say, or Lynette, where, where will this be available, this recording, this session? Um, we know that, oh, Lynette, are you going, or, or um, Mitzi, one of you can talk about Longmont Public Media and how oh. we're, we're the Yeah, sure. so I know Longmont Public Media is gonna air this so you can check their site, also YouTube for Long, Longmont Public Media and also Channel 8 and Channel 14 is also going to provide coverage on this. Did I miss anything, Lynette? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I just now learned how to share. But <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we're, we'll send you a link to um, the these events um, we'll send all of you the links to um, how to contact the CDPHE and uh, our next events and how to access them. 
So we'll do that. But you can write to Longmont Climate Community if you have any other questions that didn't get answered. Longmont Climate Community at gmail.com and, uh, and uh, for any more information. We want to thank our speakers. Y'all were excellent. And everybody that attended today, we appreciate it. Yeah, so the next event is June 13th at seven o'clock and uh, we're gonna try and make that both virtual and in person. Uh, so we don't have a location yet, but when we have an agenda and a location, we will let you know. Thank you all so much. Thanks, thanks to everybody for coming. We had a really good participation. Thank you everyone for your participation and for your great, great questions. And presenters, if you can stay on for just a few minutes, we'll just do a quick debrief before we leave. But thank you everybody for, for uh, attending. Thanks everyone. Have a, great Have a good day. Bye-bye.